You're now listening to the Adiel Gorel Show. Each episode, I'll bring you the latest news for my discussions with top health and wellness experts so that you can bring yourself into better health. Today on the Adiel Gorel Show. Well, they're, they're equally bad in both in that regard. I mean, so um, excessive adipose tissue um, is sort of like the center of all of the chronic inflammation. What happens when you have hormonal imbalances, endocrine disruptors, metabolic, you know, poor health, you're going to have infiltration of adipose tissue by inflammatory cells, which are then going to be programmed to be more pro-inflammatory. So that there's like always a sliver of truth, right? The sliver of truth is that men who become metabolically unhealthy, typically, you know, obese and typically older, but not always anymore, they will have low testosterone and they will have high estrone. And they've shown that this will often take away that male macho-ness, you know, that it really will because, you know, talking about the brain, if we, if we have time, because the brain is very different in terms of um, like some of the, the neurotransmitters produced and so on. So it's definitely true that a male who doesn't have adequate testosterone and is filled with estrone is going to often be like weak willed. He's not going to be like dynamic and brave and, you know, sort of like. I will go out there, you know, like explore the universe and so on. But it's not because um, he has too much ovarian production of estradiol. It's because he doesn't, he's like totally inflamed. He has neuroinflammation. His brain is like not healthy. His, um, you know, his entire cardiovascular system is not healthy. And he is also suffering from hormonal deficiencies from having very low testosterone. And the estrone, we know that women do have some different emotional things. Women have double the incidence of depression and anxiety as males. We are programmed differently emotionally as well. I mentioned the autonomic nervous system. We are more sensitive to, uh, to stimuli. We are more sensitive to mood. And, and I look at everything as how you frame it. I see that as good you know but that doesn't mean you know like uh, but that doesn't mean that men who have you know are sensitive that they are not also very macho and brave and strong uh, they're not exclusive but there are differences and we should celebrate them but it doesn't you know put you in like a little cubby hole where you can only do one thing like you can only clean floors or you can explore the universe it doesn't work that way but we, there are some differences and they're not superior or inferior they're just somewhat different but and and that's okay you know I can tell you going back when I was back going to college I was one of the early feminists and I was at my university Princeton University and I got a job as a mail carrier and they actually told me after I got it no you can't have that job it's only for men it's like you could say I'm a female carrier you can be a secretary it's like I don't even type very well and I had to actually file a, a, like a kind of a grievance and, and it actually made the front page of one of the New York newspapers that, you know, co-ed at Princeton in the first year of being co-ed actually took on the university because of sex discrimination and employment over a, a job, you know, so, but, you know, so the thing is that it's, we should all have equal opportunities, equal rights, but that doesn't negate understanding our differences but I don't want men to think that they shouldn't love estrogen and their bodies are filled with estrogen and they shouldn't block the estrogen and that, um, that they will be harmed if they have low testosterone and high fat content and high estrone. And that will change the way their brains work. They're going to be inflamed. They're going to lose a lot of motivation. They're going to have foggy brain, you know, brain fog I hear all the time. So, you know, these are big deals, but they're like, they're taking that sliver of truth and then they're generalizing it in ways that are truly harmful. Okay, we are going to get to the to the brain as we must. We can't have this, you know. But before we go there, I do have to ask you two questions regarding the current subject. We talk about the heart in general. So now, what does 
in the context of what we're talking about, besides all the other effects, what does being you know, overweight and having a higher body fat than is necessary, even by a lot, what's the effect on the male and on the female? Well, they're, they're equally bad in both in that regard. I mean, so um, excessive adipose tissue um, is sort of like the center of all of the chronic inflammation. What happens when you have hormonal imbalances, endocrine disruptors, metabolic, you know, poor health, you're going to have infiltration of adipose tissue by inflammatory cells, which are then going to be programmed to be more pro-inflammatory. As well, adipose tissue is really amazing. When I was back in medical school, I thought it was just so that when you sat on a hard bench, it didn't feel so uncomfortable. That's why you had <laughs> adipose tissue. And, you know, for a rainy day in case you were in a famine. But it turns out that fat adipose tissue is so much more. It makes all kinds of hormones, the adipokines. And these are very involved in appetite regulation and metabolism. And once again, they're actually regulated by estradiol. So, you know, uh, you need to have proper hormones. You have to have proper testosterone. You have to have proper estradiol to have proper adipokines. Like one of them that maybe people have heard of is called leptin. Leptin is actually modulated, regulated by estradiol, and it has many metabolic functions, including appetite regulation, and you can have resistance of the receptor for this hormone leptin, just like you can for insulin, and then your body can have very, very high production of leptin, but it's not doing its job, which is to lower appetite. So when you have all this excessive adipose tissue, you can have a very dysregulated appetite system. You don't know if you're hungry or not hungry. So you go to the default, which is you'll eat all the time. So there's no appetite regulation. It's like terrible. And then another adipokine from adipose tissue that needs to be regulated by proper hormonal balance is adiponectin. And adiponectin triggers fat burning in the mitochondria. So if you have dysregulated inflammatory fat, you're going to not be able to burn fat because making fat and burning fat are very different skill sets. So you end up in a state, in a body that is only good at making fat and not good at burning fat. And when you have all that inflammation and fat, it instills and grows insulin resistance. So now you have even more trouble because now you have insulin resistance and you have higher production from the pancreas, at least until it burns out, from the beta cells of insulin. And insulin, among its many functions, which is life, you know, you, have, you can't live without insulin, but if you have too much, then you actually promote fat production and storage as well. So when you have all that insulin, you can't lose weight. You just make fat, you store fat, and you, eventually you can't even get enough insulin out to regulate your blood sugar and the sugars really start to rise and then that is more pro-inflammatory so it's like and then when you have a lot of insulin resistance you also will end up having vascular dysfunction including to the brain and we know that vascular dementia is a huge growing problem and also the so-called i call it so-called blood brain barrier is no barrier What's supposed to be in the, in the brain, which is not working very well, is to keep out toxins, whether produced in the body, which we would call endogenous, or coming from outside of the body into the body, which we would call exogenous. It's not, it's acting as just a, a leaky filter. And so you have all these toxins getting into the brain and infectious agents, viruses, and that of course is a downward spiral for cognition and control of all the different organ systems. And so, yeah, ex extreme accumulation, which is now, what, 40% of the population in the U.S. is obese? I mean, it's like, and then like 80% is overweight, you know, and it's become the new norm. And so this creates metabolic chaos throughout the body, male and female. And in order to prevent that, you need to do everything, maintain proper hormones, whether you take them if you are older and you need them, or you do all the lifestyle things to help your organs that make them to make them properly. You know, it's just lifestyle medicine is really fundamental to health. And like in my practice, we always incorporate what is called lifestyle medicine, not pill medicine, but lifestyle medicine. So you know, adipose tissue that's excessive is harmful, male and female alike, huge. 
just to hone it a little down, I'm going to use a hypothetical example. It doesn't matter if we're talking about a male or a female. Let's say we're talking about a person whose ideal weight, maybe with a certain amount of body fat, which we all need, is 150 pounds, making up, making it up. So now, clearly, based on what you said, if they were to weigh 200 pounds, which means 50 pounds of fat extra on what they need, that's a big red flag. Change your lifestyle. Do this, do this, come to see you. But what if they weigh 160 instead of 150? Should they put the resources in another place because the difference to 160 is only 10 extra pounds of fat? Does it matter? Are there degrees? How does that show? Well, I'm glad you brought up like weight and body fat. So in like in my practice, we do body compositions because actually the BMI and just getting on a scale is already getting to be like archaic, right? Because no, the BMI makes no sense. You have a muscular yes, male. Right. So yeah. we got to do, we do body compositions because you really want to know, is that excessive body fat? Is it fluid retention? Because when you have inflammation, you have overproduction of, of another steroid hormone by the adrenal gland called aldosterone, which causes more fluid retention. And so is this excess weight, is it fluid? Is it fat? Is it that they actually have more muscle or bone? That would be really nice. So we definitely want to know what the body composition is. Now, in my practice, I actually kind of like what you were leading towards. I don't focus so much on weight as I do health. Because if the focus is on weight, often people do nutty things like starvation. That now starvation is not the ticket to health, okay? So what you want to do is sensible ways to lose weight, but what you're doing is incorporating healthy modalities and then to get healthy. And then I say the weight loss will come along for the ride. As you get metabolically healthy and all your systems become properly online, like whether it's circadian rhythm, your nutrient status, your gut, which is like hours of talk right there, right? And, um, you know, work on stress so you don't have huge amounts of cortisol, another whole giant topic that promotes insulin resistance and leaky gut and circadian rhythm dysfunction. I mean, stress is like uh, like a huge topic these days because it really is real as a cause of metabolic dysfunction, health issues and everything else. So basically I do focus on health and I keep the weight in mind, but I don't want people to be so over-focused on the weight that they just do like crazy things like go on starvation diets, which over the long haul will create a new metabolic set point so that when they start eating again, which most people do, they don't go into starvation state for the rest of their lives. And then they will actually, the body will rapidly regain that weight and often more. And most of it turns out to be fat. So it's like you end up with a worse body composition. By the way, I've seen this in people who've had gastric bypass surgery. And it's very, very upsetting, you know, when you check their body composition and they're like 60% fat, you know, and they still weigh less than they did, but they've lost so much of their lean body mass, which is essential to healthy longevity. Lean body mass is like precious cargo. So definitely every bit of unwanted fat matters, but I like to focus on health and then the fat will come off as a part of the process. Okay, so now uh, you mentioned uh, autophagy, and in these days, the word autophagy sometimes is related to the whole branch of eating called uh, you know, intermittent fasting. Mm -hmm. Because at least the general theory is that when you give a rest to the digestive system, the body can focus on doing things like uh, you know, autophagy. What do you think of intermittent fasting in general? I'm a huge fan of all the useful forms of fasting. And um, so there's different ways that you can define some of these things. It's not like fixed exactly, but I would start with what I call time restricted eating, which is how you time food intake over 24 hours. And that's really important because everything in the body is on a timer. Like when you incorporate what we call clock genes with like related to clock genes. They're not actually clock genes, but they work with clock genes. It's like 90% of all the genes in our body are related to our circadian rhythm, our timers, and including our gut function, our pancreatic function, our insulin function. So we do much better if we eat more of our food in the first half of a, of a day and less like at night. So 
it's also very beneficial. And there seems to be like in women, a sweet spot of about 13 hours of fasting from dinner to breakfast that is associated with lower risk of recurrence of postmenopausal breast cancer, for example, because you know we have limited data on actual disease states with different fasting regimens. So I'm a big fan of not snacking, of trying not to eat more than three times total for a day, and stopping eating at least three hours before you go to bed and not going to bed at, you know, very late times either, you know, and um, the earlier you stop eating, the better. And there's plenty of studies to show that, that in like one study that was done in Israel with women with polycystic ovary disease, um, which is very much a uh, metabolic dysfunction, PCOS. And what they found is that when they gave the women two thirds of their food intake in the morning, one third sort of in the mid afternoon, and that was it for the day. In one month, their insulin levels went down 50%. Their testosterone levels went down 50%. There's no drug that is that good. You know, it's amazing. And that was just by time eating. Now, if you want to create and trigger autophagy, you actually have to fast for two to three days, like real fasting of, or a fasting mimicking diet for two to three days to actually trigger autophagy, which is like when, so the way I look at it is the body is intrinsically lazy. And if you don't get any food in for one day or two days, the body says, okay, I'm just gonna wait it out, you know? But then when you get to close around three days, then the body says, "Uh uh-oh, there is no food coming in. Now we better throw the crappy cells overboard and you start triggering program cell suicide. So yucky cells will kill themselves and those cells could be causing inflammation. They could be precancerous cells, so they kill themselves. And then the good cells do, I call it cellular rehab. They take their internal components and break them down into their essential components in, I call it the recycle bin, the lysosome of the cell. And then they come out with amino acids and fatty acids, and then they reconstruct new internal organelles of the cells. So it's like total cellular rehab. And that is because if you don't have food coming in, the cell has to use what it has. So you're gonna use your own stored energy. You're gonna get rid of cells that are useless, that are taking up vital nutrients that you're not having any coming in. And then you rehab the good cells. So it's like unbelievable, this mechanism that is triggered, but only if you stop eating for at least two days, which is hard to get people to do, which is I I personally, for myself and my patients, I suggest like a fasting mimicking program because it's really hard to tell people stop eating and just drink water for the next three or four days because the maximum benefit comes from a water fast for like four days. Like, and it's really hard to get people to do that on a regular basis. And it's, and it has some risk associated too. And you've got, and no one should do these things without having some knowledgeable person in healthcare following them. But yes, but when done properly in the right population, you know, you know, that people who don't have fragile hearts or they're not real elderly or or frail, you know, there are very select populations that are excluded from this type of thing, that it can be amazing. And we have this data, of course, in mice, you know, this, like, we don't have longevity data in humans, but in mice, when they actually put them on this kind of a program, they actually lived like 11% longer. So, I mean, it was pretty, pretty nice for the mice. And uh, so you said that... Set for the women, uh, the window would be 13 hours or so. If I understand correctly for males, for various reasons, it's a little bit longer. That's hence the popularity of the 16-8 regime or the 18-6 regime. Is that true that the male needs a bit of a longer time? Well, you know, in terms of the data that I know that came out of like the, um, the Longevity Institute at USC, under Walter Longo, my understanding is that it's totally fine to go beyond 13 hours, but the return on investment actually does diminish once you get over 13 hours. And, but 13 hours, even 12 hours, seems to be in general, a hugely beneficial amount of time. Now, if someone can go longer and not have nutrient deficiencies because they're actually eating enough food and they feel okay, there's no harm in going longer. You know, that's totally fine. But for the average person, 
that is not um, as say experienced in these kinds of things, uh, I would have trouble getting them to do more than I'm. It's trouble in my practice getting people to go 12 hours people the average american is just the opposite they eat 16 hours a day you know so i'm i'm totally accepting of people who can get 12 13 hours but i'm totally fine if they want to go out to 16. okay i'm gonna go slightly deeper into this you said it's very difficult to get people to do a water fast and many people shouldn't do it because you know they need to do it yeah in concert with their health, you know, professional. But I said, it's still hard to do it. So I instead use fasting mimicking that. Can you talk about what that means? Sure. So it was devised at the Longevity Institute under the direction of Walter Longo at USC. And uh, he was doing studies on nutrition and fasting, and he was using types of worms and rodents, and they were very um, amenable to whatever he asked them to do because he could control them. Well, then when he tried to do fasting regimens for studies with humans, they didn't, they weren't very cooperative. You know, they didn't, they didn't do what he wanted them to do. So it was sort of out of the mother of necessity that he created a fasting mimicking program diet, which took a long time. So it's a fascinating kind of a thing to create food, real food, that flies under the sensors in the hypothalamus, in the brain, the nutrient sensors. So I call it, I labeled it, this is my label, I call it stealth food. So you're eating food, and it's not a lot. I mean, there's just so much you can eat, you know, and it's specially formulated as far as the nutrients that it contains, like it's very low in protein, because protein activates mTOR, you know, and through the sensors, and you're trying not to do that when you're doing fasting. That sort of promotes growth and proliferation, which is the opposite of what you're trying to create when you're in a fasting state. And you want to go into like more of a burning mode, not a growth mode. And so they actually devised a diet that people could eat that actually flies under the radar of the nutrient sensors. So you get the benefits of fasting and you get the pleasure of eating. Plus there's health benefits to eat, eating some food. And so it's like the best of all worlds and it's more practical. You know, most people are willing to do it. It's only, it's five days instead of say three or four of water fasting, but it's doable. And there's no great thing if you come up with a great strategy for health, but nobody can implement it. I mean, that's always a big challenge, right? You know, like you can tell people they don't do it, right? So knowing and doing are completely different. You can tell people oh, what's good oh. for them. But doing it is another story. So this made it something that is practical. And they're doing more and more research and they're showing benefits for the brain, like like with Alzheimer's and metabolic function and weight you know, weight issues. So, um, and there's so many things I use it for, you know, areas that they don't even have published data. But in my own practice, I find it very beneficial for pretty much all women who are trying or overweight that are trying to get healthy before conceiving because that's so important preconceptual health we don't want unhealthy women who just manage to get pregnant and then they have complications and unhealthy babies cuz you know unhealthy women they program the baby's genes and they have wrong epigenetic expression and then you have metabolically unhealthy children at birth you know so we definitely i find it very beneficial in that population also in women who are entering into the menopausal and transitional years into menopause when women when their estrogen levels start to drop which happens years before the actual period stop they start getting belly fat talking about getting back to the fat they start because without enough estrogen then the metal the whole metabolic process changes and they get that visceral fat and they find their waistline is disappearing and they're getting all that they get the muffin top and the belly fat and it's more than distressing. No woman wants that. And, and it doesn't seem to get better even when she exercises more. So it really has been shown in combination with lifestyle and eating phytoestrogen foods and sometimes giving some supplemental estrogen and then adding in a fasting mimicking program. It really revs up their metabolic function and helps with weight loss. And what's been shown is that, you know, you lose the visceral fat and maintain lean body mass. And that's so important, getting back to body composition, because I can't emphasize how important having 
muscle is with aging. Like muscle is like a whole you know, many hours of discussing on muscles because muscles not just keep you moving, but they actually are also endocrine organs. They make myokines, they make signaling agents. And that's like the, the, the area of the body that burns the most glucose. If you don't have enough muscle, you're going to be a skinny what we call skinny fat person, I didn't make up that term, who is going to be prone towards insulin resistance and diabetes. And they actually have some of the worst prognoses for lifetime you know, health and longevity are the so-called skinny fats because they don't have enough lean body mass. So we want to do everything. That's where like if people just go on starvation diets, they almost inevitably will lose a lot of their muscle mass, which is so catastrophic for the overall health picture. How can our viewers and listeners learn about the fasting mimicking diet or and or benefit from your services? Well, I'm still very much a practicing doctor. I'm actually speaking to you from one of my exam rooms. And so I have a practice called the Integrative Medical Group of Irvine in Irvine, that's Southern California. I can do some telemedicine as well. And uh, as far as the fasting mimicking diet, they did market it and the name of a product. So the name of the product is called Prolon. And that is, you know, they can, they have a website. So that is easily researched. And Professor Longo, he's like all over the internet and he has YouTubes and all kinds of stuff. So anyone who's interested can easily research and find all kinds of information out. And you can go on PubMed, you know, or Google Scholar, where you can actually, as anybody, can find pub, peer-reviewed published articles, and they have abstracts and full articles all about fasting mimicking. If you put in the Google search bar, fasting mimicking diet, you won't believe how much stuff is going to come up. So, okay. Uh, I know that we are going to have another interview, and thank you very much for being so generous with your time, because uh, there is a lot to cover, we want to talk about the brain, we want to talk about male and female sexuality, and we want to, you are so thorough, I'm very glad that we'll have another interview. But I do have one small question so far. What, you talked about the perimenopause period where the estrogen level already starts going down, not quite complete menopause. What is your general sense or feeling or opinion about uh, estrogen and other hormonal replacement as menopause starts? Well, we know that there's already vascular changes for the worse in the perimenopausal women. We know that there's an increase with the onset of menopause of, for example, depression doubles from what it was. And if you have a history of like PMS or you've had postpartum depression or other depressive states, the risk goes up fourfold. So the bottom line is I could go organ system by organ system and women will talk about the brain next time women have two and a half times or more of the incidence of Alzheimer's as men. This is all due to estrogen in the form of estradiol deficiency. So I consider menopause not a disease, it's natural, but that doesn't mean it's good. There's, I mean, those of us in medicine are always trying to change the course of something natural you know, and they create all kinds of unnatural things like joint replacements and pharmaceuticals. So to me, you're being the most proactive to prevent all that other downstream stuff by giving human bioidentical hormones at physiologic levels. So you're trying to replicate average levels that a healthy woman have, like a 25 year old who has natural hormones. So that once you recognize and accept that hormones are the information delivery system there are others, but this is a major one of the body that delivers information to the cells so that it can turn on and off genes, produce enzymes, proteins, kinases, signaling agents, so that the cells can do their job properly. And without the proper hormones at the right amounts and so on, you're, the cells are not going to be able to do their jobs properly. Cells do not know how old they are. So, you know, you have cells of all different ages in your body. Your gut cells were not the same ones you were born with, you know? So the cells don't care how old you are. They care about getting the right nutrients, about getting the right information. So if we can maintain proper nutrition and sleep and, and environmental toxins to be kept under control, and we maintain 
physiologic levels of hormones, we can slow the inexorable problems associated with aging. We're not stopping aging because I can't replace ovary. You know, when I give hormones, I'm not creating a 25 year old's ovaries again. I'm doing better, better than no hormones. So once you get over that crazy fear that was created from that unfortunate women's health initiative study back 20 years ago, where they didn't use human hormones, where they used the wrong population of patients, where they actually over-exaggerated the outcomes as it was. And then after they reformulated the outcomes, nobody knew what they were. You know, once you get over that fear and you embrace hormones for what they are, they're natural and they're critical to enabling every cell to know what to do and when to do it, then of course you will want to be on hormones. And that's what I do. I look at hormones as sort of a necessary but not sufficient tool to help every woman and male in regarding like testosterone, which declines not off the cliff like a woman with menopause, but often a slow decline. And so every person needs hormones. And nobody would take out somebody's thyroid gland due to say a big benign goiter and they had to have it removed, say, and say, okay, now you don't have hormones. That's okay. Why don't you don't have any thyroid? Why don't we give you Prozac? Why don't we tell you to meditate, eat more vegetables? Well, I'm not for the Prozac part, but eating more vegetables and meditating, sure, that's great, but it's not going to replace the missing hormone. And once you lose your estradiol from your ovaries, nothing replaces it. We can do things to help the body to work better. We can eat phytoestrogen foods. We can do all the lifestyle stuff, but that's not replacing the missing hormones. And once you get back to what I started at the very beginning of this interview, which is that whether we want to be reproducing or not, the fundamental prime directive of life is reproduction. The female body is interconnected between reproductive functions and metabolic functions. That means every organ system is linked by estrogen in the form of estradiol. When you lose reproductive functions, you lose metabolic homeostasis, that calmness and sort of control over all the systems of the body. So I guess you can see I'm pretty darn passionate about taking estradiol and of course yeah. progesterone. It's very essential to help every cell in the body to do the right job to maintain the health of the organ, the health of the body. But going back to those studies with the synthetics and all the common right. uh, culture knowledge, the question will immediately be, yes, but what are the side effects? Is she now with more at risk for breast cancer? Is she now more at risk for this? Uh, are these even bioidentical hormones at the right levels? Do they also carry a risk? Well, you're not replacing the ovaries. So the biggest risk are minor things like irregular bleeding. When a woman has her uterus and it has a lining, the lining is receptive, has receptors to these hormones. So we will have bleeding and we could have random bleeding. These are potential things that we have to sometimes deal with as we get the right amount for the right woman. When we give estrogen, in the form of estradiol, we're giving it through the skin. Now, we didn't evolve to have skin as a delivery system for our hormones, so it's kind of wild that we can actually get away with that, considering skin is supposed to be a barrier. So how hormones, estradiol is absorbed through the skin can be quite variable from woman to woman and even you know within the same woman over time and the different products that are used. So this is where the real art comes in, you know, in terms of trying to control, making sure that she doesn't have like too much where she may have fluid retention or, or have even maybe a headache or too little or have irregular bleeding. These are all things that when you get you know, proficient at giving hormones, you can deal with every one of these. And you tell people, you know, in the beginning, it's, you know, there you have to be ready for potential little side effects, but these are not life-threatening. These are just annoyances as we get the, the hormones right for each woman. In terms of like breast cancer, um, breast cancer, is not caused by estradiol. It's caused by inflammation, and then it's promoted by the production locally in the breast through the action of aromatase on androgens, which creates estrone. So it's not estradiol. There's a reason why more estrogen 
well, we'll say more breast cancer occurs in postmenopausal women by far, and younger women are getting more breast cancer, but it's because of the prevalent endocrine disruptors that disrupt the normal estrogen function and production in the body. So the bottom line is that I could go organ system by organ system, which I have to some degree, and extol the benefits of estradiol on every organ system. It doesn't cause cancer. Now, if someone has an estrogen receptor positive cancer, there is always a chance that it may promote the growth. That's why we don't want to give it to someone who already has a pre-existing cancer, um, although that's even, there may be some question on that, but we, that's a considered a contraindication. So don't give it to someone who has an estrogen receptor positive cancer. But when it comes to causing cancer, it doesn't cause cancer, it probably actually prevents cancer. And in fact, in the Women's Health Initiative study, the estrogen only arm, which was on the conjugated equine estrogens, that's the estrogens that came from the horse, pregnant horse's urine, which even the horse didn't want, it was trying to get rid of, but using that and then powderizing it and making it into a tablet, when they used that as the only hormone treatment, they didn't give the chemical endocrine disruptor progestin, medroxyprogesterone acetate, those women actually had a lower incidence of breast cancer. The bottom line is estrogen alone, when you took away that other toxic chemical, which we would never give now anyway, that actually reduced the risk of breast cancer. So, and there's studies that, there's just a recent one that is an observational study that showed something like seven like cancers had lower incidence in women who are on hormones. So it's probably, it actually helps with a lot of gene expression that's involved in tumor suppressor, suppressor genes. So it's actually probably anti-cancer, not pro-cancer, as long as it's real human hormones given in the proper manner. So that's why, I mean, I'm really against like not knowing what you're doing when you're giving hormones. You, everyone should know what they're getting, why they're getting it, what's their motive, what are their end goals, and the person prescribing it should really understand what hormones do and how to deal with the initial side effects and we'll call the minor you know, inconveniences of bleeding or swelling or little stuff until you get it right. But when you look at the benefits down the road, to me, there's no question it's worth the effort. So I know we have another interview, we have a lot to cover, but since we are on the subject, I'm going to ask one more question. So you gave a wonderful response and expose about female hormone supplementation in the right way. Pros, I mean, now can I jump over to the males? Mm -hmm. So you said that the male, the testosterone goes down more gradually, and yet it does go down and testosterone uh, supplementation in males uh, has all the benefits that people normally talk about is associated with that but people again right away they talk prostate and prostate cancer and the mm -hmm. risk can you briefly uh, talk about that side of the equation well there's been some published research by um, a male urologist um, and he showed that that's not true okay that testosterone is not promoting in any form or fashion prostate cancer so like prostate is like the analogous organ in the male to the female uterus. And so it also has the enzyme aromatase. And once again, when you're in an inflammatory environment, you're gonna have upregulation of that enzyme. So you're gonna have local production of estrone in the prostate. So that is a pro-growth hormone, but it should be growth under control because growth is also repair, rejuvenation. It's you know it's how you look at growth, but uncontrolled growth or uncontrolled proliferation is what then can cause a prostate to be enlarged. And we know that prostatic hypertrophy is like a huge problem for males and then they can't urinate properly. It blocks their urethra and so on. So it's really local inflammation in the prostate gland that's taking androgens and converting them into estrone once again. And so it's not having testosterone, like young males who have great testosterone levels, they're not the ones that are getting enlarged prostates, they're not the ones who are getting prostate cancer, but like every cancer now that has any hormonal receptors, endocrine disruptors, the chemicals, the poisons are increasing, you know, a lot of different cancers, the ability to detoxify, you know, so that you can not have high toxic loads in the body and so on. But 
Testosterone doesn't cause prostate cancer. Now, can it feed the prostate cancer? Well, once again, if you have prostate tissue there and it can convert to estrone, there's always that possibility that it could promote growth. So, you know, that's why you have to be careful. So I'm not going to say that you should treat prostate cancer with testosterone. I, the takeaway message is that it's not causing and it may actually be preventing prostate cancer in the first place. Dr. Gersh, even just on the subject we covered today, I could have gone, at least for me, for another 16 hours, if you would be generous enough. But obviously, we've been here, and I'm so glad we'll have another interview. I want to thank you for the bottom of my heart. I think the information you gave me and our viewers and listeners is valuable. And, and useful. So looking forward to uh, talking to you soon. Thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure. Looking forward to the next one. Same here. Thank you for joining me today for the second part of our amazing interview. If you didn't catch part one, don't miss out. The link is in the description below for you. And be sure to click the subscribe button for more videos.